You're listening to the Online Marketing Made Easy podcast, episode number 95. Welcome to the Online Marketing Made Easy podcast. Business advice so easy, you'll feel like you're cheating. And now your host, Amy Porterfield. Hey there, Amy Porterfield here, and welcome to another episode of the Online Marketing Made Easy podcast. Thank you so very much for tuning in. Now, have you ever had an idea and you thought, ooh, this is a good one. This is good. And so you put it all together and maybe it's for your online marketing business. So you spend time and effort and money putting it together. You put it out into the world and there's like crickets. Nothing ever comes of it. You think it's going to sell really well, but your audience has other ideas. Or have you ever had an idea, you asked your audience, hey, would you invest in something like this or that? And they all raise their hand. They say, yes, I will. I love that idea. Do it. And then you do it. And it's like crickets. Like, where did all the people go that raised their hand and said that they would actually want to buy this or that that you've created? I know it's frustrating, but it happens to the best of us. Now I have a solution for you. What if you could take your idea through a process to make sure that that idea is a good fit for you and your business and a good fit for your audience? That way, you never again have to spend a ton of money or time or blood, sweat, and tears creating something that's not going to sell. Sounds pretty good, right? Well, that is why I've invited my good friend Pat Flynn on the show today to talk about that very, very specific topic, how to know if your idea will really work. He's just written a book called Will It Fly? We'll talk about that book, but specifically because Pat and I are very similar, we like to get to the specifics and the details and the action items. This is like a mini training session. We're gonna walk you through some ideas and insights and tips to help you get started in terms of understanding is your idea really going to work for you and your audience. This is a priceless episode because it's filled with so many good, valuable tips that you can take action on right away. Now, before we get there, I've got a few quick words about our sponsor. Before we dive in, I want to thank our sponsor today, 99designs. Now, I'm such a huge fan of this company because they can take care of all your graphic needs. We're talking logos, social media cover images, website graphics, and so much more. So visit 99designs.com forward slash Amy and get a $99 upgrade for free. Okay, I won't make you wait any longer. Let's go ahead and jump in to my special interview with Pat Flynn. Pat Flynn, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Oh, I'm so happy to be here, Amy. Thank you. And I have to apologize to everybody out there who's listening to me who has heard me before because my voice is a little bit different. I am a little under the weather today. Uh, I caught something from my son, which he caught from somebody at school, which I don't know. It's just <laughs> ever since my son's been going to school, it's like every two months I get really sick. It's just, this it's totally normal. Of, it's, okay. Is it? Okay. But I need to tell you, I think you sound really manly. Really? Okay. Yes. Well, maybe I should just permanently change my voice to this. <laughs> this is uh, working for me. Yeah. Oh, I love it. This is, <laughs> and this, yeah, this is perfect timing actually. Okay. Perfect. So <laughs> let's get right to it. I already did a proper intro for you, but I have to say your bio is kind of amazing and you are very well known for going from a dream job layoff to founding your own business and doing some amazing things. But I want you kind of to take me back there a little bit before we get into all the goodness around this amazing book that you've recently written. I want to talk to you about filling in the blanks of your journey to get to where you are today. And I want you kind of to take us back to the time where you got laid off. And I'm sure that was these crazy emotions, but you moved into actually starting your own thing and having amazing success with that. So kind of where were you when you got laid off? Like, where was your head in all this? And how did you go from that situation to making the decision? I'm doing my own thing. Well, you know, I'd spent all this time in school doing everything I was supposed to do. Even when I got my job as a, as an architect, like doing everything I was supposed to do there, climbing the corporate ladder to have it all taken away from me, even though I was doing everything the way I was supposed to was, was just bone crushing. 
to me. It was like that. That's like I thought I was doing everything to secure my job, but obviously I wasn't. And the only way to take control would be to take control and do my own thing. And actually, when I got laid off, I had about two or three months between the time that I was told I was going to get or that I was told I got laid off to when I was actually going to be officially let go, which like sucked even more because I counted down the days of that of that sort of termination date. And during that time, I just obviously didn't do any work. I was depressed. And I started to I actually moved back with my parents. And so did my fiance, just so we could save money for a wedding. I had just proposed to my wife oh. too before I got laid off. So it was like the worst timing ever. But on the train ride from San Diego to Irvine, which is about a two hour train ride, I started listening to music and all that stuff. And then I got bored of my playlist. And then I discovered podcasts. And to make a long story short, I discovered a podcast that interviewed a guy who was making six figures a year, helping people pass an exam called the project management exam. And I took an exam that was really difficult in the architecture space. And I was like, maybe I can take this information and turn it into a business. And I did that. And so in October, of 2008, which was a, f a few months afterwards, um, I had taken that information that uh, that I had about this exam and turned it into a business, wrote a study guide to help people pass that exam too, and it just took off. And actually, that was the same month that I got officially let go. So it was an amazing, perfectly timed transition period. And, you know, I tell a lot of people this story, and they, they think I'm lucky. And, and, you know, in a sense, I am. But I also know that these opportunities to do my own thing have always existed. It's just I finally realized that they were there because I was just kind of conditioned to grow up in the way that I was supposed to and not even realize that I could go out and venture on and, and do something on my own. And it wasn't until I got laid off that, like, I grew, the, the I guess, I mean, to for lack of better terms, the balls that I needed to put myself out there <laughs> and actually make it happen. Because, you know, if I didn't get laid off, I, I guarantee you I would still be an architect today. And, you know, maybe I would be happy, maybe not, but I definitely wouldn't have the freedom that I have now that I have my own business. So, you know, because I got laid off and I didn't have a plan B, I just did whatever it, uh, I needed to do. And uh, I wouldn't do that if I didn't get laid off. So it was, it was a blessing in disguise, definitely. And then from there, you know, I was just so tremendously thankful for everything that happened. That's when I started smartpassiveincome.com, which is where most people know me from now. And I just share everything. I'm like, man, I, if I was starting out, back in the day, this is the site I would want because I just want somebody who's honest and authentic, who shares everything, all the wins, all the failures. And I just want to follow that person's example. And so I'm, I, I'm trying to be that example. I, that's why I call myself the crash test dummy of online business. I try new things and I experiment and I see what works, see what doesn't. Whatever happens, it's always a lesson for everybody. And as a result, I've been building this amazing platform. And now I like speak and I write books and I'm getting paid for it. It's ridiculous. Like I couldn't have dreamt anything like this. And I'm just super thankful for, uh, for how things turned out. Isn't it kind of crazy ridiculous if you look back and see everything that you've created and how quickly that's all happened? I mean, it, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's crazy. Insane. It is. And I know it doesn't happen that quickly for everybody. Although let's, let's talk about that. How many years have you been growing your business? I mean, this is seven going on eight years now. Okay. So it's, it's so a it's long not time. overnight. No, definitely not. And definitely I just, not easy. Not easy at all. It just feels like you've had some amazing success so quickly, but then that's a great kind of aha moment for me right now. Like, no, it wasn't overnight. Definitely. And you've been working really hard at it. I know you're one of the hardest worker working guys in the internet marketing space for sure. I've seen you in action. I know what's going on behind the scenes. And let's talk real quickly about your website, smartpassiveincome.com. You really do share it all. And I, I share a lot of stuff inside my business, but I don't even go to the extreme that you do where you are publishing your monthly revenue reports. Like every mm -hmm. single month, we know how much you made, how much you spent, where did you spend it? And we know everything that's going on in your business. Is there ever a moment that you think, this is weird. Am I sharing too much? Could it hurt my business? I don't know. Are there those thoughts that ever cross your mind? I mean, of course, they, across, they cross my mind. But I think the benefits definitely outweigh the cons here. When I'm trying to help people, they want to know exactly what's going on. And in order to do that, I need to, I need to share all that stuff. And I know that's not in everybody's cup of tea. But in order for me to, you know, really be the person that people look up to. I need to share all bits of it. And you know, that income doesn't always go up. It, it goes down. But like I said, it's always a lesson involved. There's always a reason for that. And I share that. And, you know, I, I sort of see it like, you know, how companies in the stock market, they reveal their quarterly reports to their investors or yep. potential investors. Just, you know, they share all the numbers too. 
every company out there who's public shares those same kinds of numbers. And they do that because they want to show how the company's doing and I'm, do, I'm doing sort of the same thing. And even though people aren't investing you know, directly their income with me like you would in, in the stock, people are investing their time with me, which is, you know, an, an even more important asset. So I want to make sure people know exactly what's going on so they can choose to and comfortably choose to uh, spend their time with me if they do want to learn from me. Now, I'm going to link to those reports in my show notes because I think it's really important for people to see exactly what you've created and what you're doing in your business. I think it's one of the biggest contributions you make to the online marketing world, showing all of the, those details. So I'll definitely link to the show notes, but I, I want to ask you about transitioning from your very first online marketing endeavor, the certification program, and then moving into so many other areas of your business. When did you figure out, wait a second, if I can do this with this certification program, then I could do this in bigger ways, more ways, and take it to in a totally new direction. Like how did that evolve? Yeah, well, it's interesting because the lead exam program that is still going very well. And the next thing I did after that actually wasn't smart passive income. It was a joint venture between my wife and I, or my fiance and I. I didn't she, know that. No, no. Like I haven't really shared this very much because it's kind of embarrassing, but um, <laughs> I'm happy to share it here because I'm an open book. This is good uh, stuff. <laughs> So April and I, we were like, oh my gosh, this lead site's doing really well. Like, let's create a website together. Well, what should we talk about? Okay, well, you know, we're going to get married. Let's, let's just have one of those personal blogs between couples and they talk about things. And then I had this idea of, well, what if we every week have a topic that both of us discuss and in a, in a very separate way where you could have like the male point of view and the female point of view. I like it. Again, which is sounded like a good idea. And so I actually spent a couple thousand dollars, some of the earnings I had from my other business, building a website platform because there was no themes out there that could have this sort of side by side kind of setup. So I, I'd spent a couple thousand dollars to do that. And then we were like, okay, everything's set up. Let's write it. It was actually called a couple of thoughts.com. Right? Cute. Get it? Thought, right? I get it. Uh, and then we were like, this is going to go big. We're going to get, we're going to get <laughs> to go on Oprah and talk about <laughs> like, like, again, these huge big ideas. And then we started to write and it was just the worst process <laughs> in the world. Like we were, couldn't, couldn't write the, in this way. We were like, this is difficult. And how do we make it comical and funny, but also educational. And we were actually getting into fights and the, like, this is, we were just like, okay, this is stupid. Like, Let's scrap the whole thing. We let the domain expire. And, you know, that was actually my first example of uh, truly failing in the online space and actually rushing into things. Like the lead exam stuff, that kind of just happened naturally through my own experiences and what I start, when I started to listen to what other people needed, I served them in that way. This one was like, okay, I got this idea. Let's build it. Let's put it out there. Let's see what happens. And then, you know, obviously it didn't work out. So if we had flipped the order and actually just started writing first, we would have easily seen immediately that this was not going to work out. We would have saved time. We would have saved money. And that kind of relates to actually the, the, the book that I have coming out now, which is all about validating those ideas beforehand. But Okay, that, see, so that's a perfect segue. I didn't even set it up that way, but we are so good together, Pat. It just made its way in there. So let's talk <laughs> about this because you just wrote a book, which congratulations, I can only imagine how much blood, sweat, and tears you put into this book. Uh, thank you. I think part, part of the reason why my voice is the way it is is because of this book. I'm sure. There's no <laughs> doubt. And it's called Will It Fly, correct? Mm -hmm. And talk to me about the inspiration, why you wrote this book, just the passion around it. And I think it's such a brilliant idea because I'll just say up front that this area that you're going to explore with the book is something that comes up with my students over and over again. And I love that I can give them a guidebook like, okay, this is the path you need to take to figure this out. So talk to me about this book and then we're going to dive into some specifics so people can walk away with some action items today. Yeah, totally. I'm happy to, to share the different exercises and litmus tests in the book that you can take away with you, whether you get the book or not. So cool. I'm definitely happy to do that. Thank you again, Amy. Yeah. Um, well, the, the book is called Will It Fly? How to Test Your Next Business Idea So You Don't Waste Your Time and Money. And the subtitle kind of tells it all. It's about testing your idea before you actually build it to see if it's going to work. And, you know, I, I like the title, Will It Fly? Because, you know, it's, it's, it's like the idea of, you know, we always launch stuff and launching is, is a big part of it. But after you launch, then what happens? Is it actually going to take off? Is it going to fly? Is it going to keep going? Or is it just going to crash? And so that's one part of it. And also I like it in, in the slang sense of like, you know, flies and cool. Like, is this, is this cool with you? Like, is this fly? And, you know, I kind of mentioned that because there's actually two kinds of validation that I talk about in this book. There's the 
product or idea to market validation. How do you know if your idea is actually going to work in that market you're getting into, which is, the, which is actually the second part of the book. The first part, which is more important, is how do you know if this idea, this business that you're thinking of creating actually fits with you? Ooh. Does this line up with you and does it, does it complement your strengths? Does it fit into your lifeline? Does it fit into your goals? And that's an, a really important part that I know a lot of people skip over because sometimes we see these exciting things. It's like low-hanging fruit and you get, you get it and it's like maybe not the thing that you should have gone into. And you know, I, don't, I know a lot of entrepreneurs who are very successful entrepreneurs but they're not successful parents or they're not successful spouses. You know, they've climbed up and they're at the top of a ladder, but it's the wrong ladder. Yes. And so, you know, I want to get them beforehand and actually capture them and make sure that their ideas are actually ones that fit into their life. And then if it is, then they can move forward and see if it validates into the market that they're getting into. And the reason this book is so important, and it kind of aligns with what you said about what your students are saying. You know, actually, I, I have another podcast beyond the Smart Passive Income podcast called Ask Pat, which comes out five days a week. And I collect voicemail questions from my audience and I answer one five days a week, which is really cool. But a, a cool byproduct of having this platform is I get these questions coming in every single day. I literally get dozens of questions from my audience. And it's cool because I can hear their voice and all that stuff. And they tell me a little bit about who they are. And a lot of the questions are just that. How, how do I know this thing I'm working on is actually going to work? Because let's face it, we, we, we don't have all the time in the world. You know, we, we, and we have, we're so busy. So we want to make sure that the time we spend doing something like building a business is time well spent. And it's actually going to you know, we're giving ourselves a good chance to have it work out instead of what a lot of people do, which like I did with that couple of thoughts thing. Traditionally, it's like you build something and you shout from the rooftops and you're like, buy my thing. And then nobody buys it or nobody goes there. And you just are left wondering why, where when you go through the validation process, it's actually an iterative process where step by step, you can see what parts working and you keep going. And if you, if you get to a, a point where you're stuck, that's where, you know, you need to fix something or things didn't work out. Okay. And so the goal behind this book is I want people to read it and have one of two things happen. They read it and, you know, as soon as possible, they, you know, there's a red flag and that idea doesn't stick with them and it just doesn't make sense for them. And so they throw it out and move onto another idea and to be comfortable with that. Cause I know a lot of us have a hard time letting go of ideas too. And this will kind of help you both through data and certain thought experiments do that much quicker, or they go through it, they get through it, it essentially validates at their, their all, all of their, all their ideas and actually you can get paid for those ideas up front. That is actually the best and truest form of validation is having somebody not say, oh yeah, that's a great idea. I would totally buy that if you had it for sale. Right. It is, no, I'm going to pay you right now so that when this comes out, I'm going to be one of the first customers. And that's kind of what the process of this book leads to. And I want people to, if their idea sticks, to go through it. And essentially the book gives them permission to move forward and build that thing. Because you know, I know you have a lot of students. I have students too. And one of the, th the interesting things is that a lot of people have great ideas and they, they, they know what they're supposed to do. They just want permission to do it. Yes, yeah, so true. And so this book is going to be sort of that permission giver, I guess you could say. I love that. Okay. So take me through these sections of the book. Like what does it look like to get the validation or get really clear that there is no validation here? Sure. So the first part, like I said, uh, which is called mission design. It's all about how this idea fits into you and your life and your strengths. So there's actually three different tests and thought experiments that you can do, which are really fun. And it's just a, a, a way to put context to thinking about the future or who you are. And so the first one is called the airport test. And I love this. It's actually part of a hiring. It's part of the hiring process that Keller Williams International Realty uses in their hiring process when they try to get new employees. And the cool thing about this is that when they do this, it's actually a way to validate that, yes, this person's actually qualified for their business, but it's also a way for them to say, actually, we are qualified to serve you as the employer. Oh, I and, like it. Okay. You know, it's like if, if the employer says, for example, oh, like, I want to do this in my life, and Keller Williams is like, well, we can't support that, then they know up front that that's not going to be a good marriage. They can split ways. Everybody will be happy knowing that they didn't have to go through, you know, years of employment to only have it, you know, backfire down the road. So the way the airport test works is, let's say, Amy, that for whatever reason, you and I, we don't talk for a long time. And five years down the road, five years down the road, we see each other at an airport, you know, we're crossing, crossing paths. And I see you, I mean, that would be really exciting for me, actually, to see you again. And I'd just be <laughs> like, oh my gosh, Amy, like, how are you? And you say, life is awesome. Life couldn't get any better. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so happy for you. Like, tell me more. Why? Why? Why is, why is life perfect right now for you? 
And that's what you have to think about. Like, what would make you say that life is perfect five years from now? We don't often think about it like that. We often hear, oh, what's your five-year plan? But right. this puts context to it. And so what you do is you take a sheet of paper or a worksheet that you can download in the companion course that comes along with the book, which is free. Oh, nice. And there are four different sections in this piece of paper. So you divide it into four sections. You name each of those four quadrants the top four categories of your life that are most important to you. So for me, it would be family, professional, finance, and health. And then you just list what would make you say life is awesome at those points in life. And when you fill out this sheet, it becomes everything that you're working for. And it becomes a huge, an easy way for you to make decisions. Because a lot of times when I've done this exercise with people, they see the sheet in front of them that is what they are shooting for five years from now. And they go, oh my gosh, what I'm doing right now does not support any of this. And it's wow. a, like a huge immediate realization for them. Or, oh my gosh, this business idea would not fit into this. And so this airport test is really, really powerful. Um, the other one that I want to share is called uh, the history test. So, you know, the airport test, we take the DeLorean into the future. The history test, we go into the DeLorean and go into the past. And we actually look and analyze like three or four of the different jobs that we've had in the past or things that you were involved with. And you actually discover what it is you liked about those and what it is you didn't like about them and even extract like a favorite memory from those things too to make sure that this thing you're going to work on fits into that um, trajectory or incorporates the things that you like and not the things that you didn't like. For example, when I looked in my past and all the things that I uh, enjoyed or didn't enjoy, I found out that I needed to be around people. I needed to talk to people. I also am very motivated by getting compliments in terms of helping people. So getting thank yous for the work that I do, which is something I didn't get in my architecture job. So I make sure that now I set, I set myself up in a way that actually I have those things incorporated in what I do. And it's interesting because a lot of us, we live life and we go through the motions without realizing what we like and don't like until we look back and analyze. And this way you can go back and like, I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, why do we take history class? Like, it's stupid. Well, we, we go to history class so that we know what not to do or right. that we can incorporate the things that we do like into the future. I mean, that's, that's why that exists. And so I incorporate those things uh, into, the, into part one, which is about, you know, how does this idea fit into you? So that, that's the first part. And, you know, probably one of my favorite parts. It's a lot of fun. And every time I've run those experiments, uh, it's, it's been really cool. Okay, two observations there. One, okay. I think it's so refreshing that that's where you start in the book. I actually wasn't expecting that until I got to review all your materials. And I thought this is perfect because I know, Pat, that your lifestyle and the time you spend with your family and the environment you create for yourself is so very important in terms of the whole scheme of this business that you've created. Mm -hmm. So you've taken those values that you already have and you started there like, let's not create a business that we don't love. And right. I think it's so easy to create a business that you don't love when you leave corporate and you're so determined to make your business work. So for me, like I took on clients in the beginning and I had all these clients doing social media and I looked back in two years into my business and realized, holy cow, I've just created a business that I absolutely hate. It was successful. And like you said, I was doing really good on the business side, but I was freaking miserable in my personal life because it wasn't a business I loved. So I know firsthand how powerful it can be to really reevaluate. So for some people, you're going to be reevaluating what you've already created. But I have a question for you. And that is, there's a lot of people that come to me and say, Amy, can you help me with my business ideas? Like, I don't know what to create or where to start. And I feel like I know that's not necessarily why you wrote the book, but I think it can help people if they just go through section one, they start getting a good idea of what they want to do. Am I right? Or maybe I'm on the wrong track. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, okay. people are going to go into this book with an idea and people are going to go into this book without an idea. Okay. By the end of part one, they're definitely going to have something on their mind because they're going to have a little bit more direction in terms of where they want to go, who they are. And actually, the, the, the third experiment I'll just share with you is called the shark bait test. And it's actually a thought experiment where you put yourself into the shark tank, which is, you know, the, the, um, you know, the show, the, the show oh, shark okay. tank. So you're literally there in front of the, the investors and then, you know, you pitch your idea and then, you know, uh, Kevin O'Leary in the middle says, well, why, what's stopping me from hiring somebody to do exactly what you're doing? So essentially it's, why are you special is the question. Oh, I like it. Okay. Which is a really, I mean, if you're in that situation, it's very intimidating to get that question. It's yes. a very harsh question, but it's, it's one that we need to answer now before we move on. It's what are your superpowers? What makes you special? What makes you unique that Kevin would be stupid not to hire you. 
or oh, I love this. You know, so it gets into more detail and, and you know, there's actually steps in, in, the, in that particular chapter, but that, that's the third one and, and actually one of my favorites too. Um, but getting into the actual product. So, okay, you validated this idea. Then it gets into a little bit of the market research and market research can be really scary for a lot of people. Really but- scary and overwhelming and a little bit stressful. Right, but I break it down. That's that's I that's my superpower is taking okay. these really complicated things and breaking it down. I it actually is. literally just because I knew I was writing this book and I wanted to pull an example, I asked my Facebook page peeps, what what do you think my superpower is? And um, you know, most people are saying taking these incredibly complex things and making them easy uh, uh, to consume, which is such I'm, a huge compliment. You should really s- stay in the moment with that one. That's really cool. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm very thankful that they validated that because that is what I know is my superpower. I have this uncanny ability to not have that curse of knowledge as Chip and Dan Heath call it when it's hard to know what it's not like. It, it, once you know something, it's hard to know what it's like not to know it anymore. But I'm, I'm good at putting myself in the customer's or, or reader's shoes, which is what I feel like I do a good job in the book. So anyway, uh, market research, I break it down. There's sort of two phases in the market research phase before you actually go and start talking to people and actually getting paid for it potentially. So the first one is called what I like to call the market map. And this is where you discover the three Ps of your audience. And the three Ps of your market are the first P is uh, discovering the places where they're at. So there's actually a lot of exercises and, and uh steps in the book to help you find out where your audience exists. So the places, the second one is the people who are the other influencers in that space. And then there is the, uh, products. So you have the places, the people and the products. And once you have all those, and you actually create a spreadsheet of of all those things and where they're at, you actually have an amazing bird's eye perspective on everything that's going on in that target market in terms of where people are at, who is serving that 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 person or that audience, and what are they buying or what's being offered to them already? So again, you can already start to see how this can help you position yourself in that space you're about to enter. And a yep. lot of times, you're going to learn more about that particular space than people who are in it serving that audience already. And a lot of people feel like that when they get late into a in, into a market, you know, they 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 almost feel like they're behind. But actually, you should flip that around. You actually have an advantage coming in late because you can see what's missing. You can go on Amazon and read the reviews for everything. You know, read the, read the, here's a tip, read the three-star reviews for products that are being offered to your, to your Ooh, target customer. that's customer. a good one. Because the three-star reviews are the honest ones. You know, the f- five-star ones might be just fans or, you know, sometimes people buy those, which is crazy. Or the one-star reviews are just haters or whatever. But the three-star reviews, you'll often see, sometimes you actually see people literally list out the pros of that thing and the cons of that thing. And that will give you amazing insight on, well, what is it, what is it that's missing? Or what, what is it that your target audience actually wants? And it's in their own words. You don't have to guess anymore at that part, at, at, at that point. And this market map that you create, those three Ps, if you move forward with this idea and you validate it, this is going to become one of the most useful tools in your arsenal because you have, not, you have now all the places where they're at, all the places you can go to potentially guest posts, all the places you can go to to even advertise and all, all those sorts of things. You have a list of all the people that you could potentially partner with, that you could JV with, that you can get on their show, that you can create a product with. And then you have a list of all the products that are already there so you can create something that's better and also get a gauge on how much people are paying or what the pricing is like and even become an affiliate for those products too. So that's the first part of market research. But then it gets into, okay, let's get into the customer's head. We talked about the market in general. Let's get into the customer's head. And, you know, I know that you've heard this before and, and you know, I don't know if you teach this, but but this whole idea about, um, you know, finding a customer avatar. Is that something that, that you, oh, you know? Oh, yeah, that's a big one for my audience. Yeah, I mean, I, lo- I love the idea of the, of the avatar. I mean, it's so important to know who that audience member is. But I, I have, I've always struggled with that. Oh, and, all the time. And, and the reason I struggle with it is because I, I, like, I feel like it's fake, right? Like I'm making up this imaginary yes, yes. person and I like have to give them a name and it's a little weird to me, you know? And I never fully connect. And the, per- the purpose of the avatar is so you know who you're speaking to, which I, I agree with 100%. But if you're trying to really feel your audience, feeling an imaginary person and what they're going through isn't going to work. Okay. You know, you if you have a better solution, you better bring it on because this is something that my students really struggle with. Okay, cool. Well, I'll, let me just give it to you. Okay. I'm, gonna give I'm to you. so excited. This is called what I call the customer plan, P-L-A-N. And that's an acronym, the plan. And this is the plan. So the first one is you want to discover through conversations, through research, through surveys and whatnot. I give you all that in the book the problems that your audience is going through. So that's the first P, is the problems. 
the problems. And so, you know, you actually start to build a, a separate spreadsheet with all of these things listed out. And, you know, there's, there's a purpose for all of this. But the first one is the problems. And so there's a lot of questions you can ask. There's a lot of things you can do in those conversations or surveys, like what is the number one struggle you have is obviously one that um, gets thrown around a lot because it's it's very useful. But also, what's something you do every day that you just absolutely hate? What is something that you use to help you that you think could be done in a better way? What is, if you had a magic wand, what's something that you would change about what it is that you do right now? All those questions are really good for discovering, you know, what truly the problems and the pains are that your audience is going through. Okay. Next, you start to list out the L which are the, the language that your audience uses. And I know you know this is important because oh, you do good. advertising, but you need to know how your audience describe those things. You need to know what language they use, not just the keywords, but the questions they ask, the complaints that they have. And again, Amazon is a great place to discover the language that your target audience uses. And then the A, which is my favorite part. And this is where you start to get the feels with your audience that is different, different than what you get with just a made-up avatar. The A is the anecdotes, stories, that your target audience is telling online. Oh, okay. And you can discover this in a really easy way. So here's a cool trick. If you go to Google, and you know when you put quotations around something, it just finds that exact phrase. Um, yeah. Right? But if you put quotations around something, and then space, site, colon, and then a website URL, it looks for that exact phrase everywhere in that particular URL. Okay, so like, give me an example of how you'd use this. So if I... If, if I typed in Amy Porterfield yeah. in Google space site colon smartpassiveincome.com, it would, Google would spit out every mention of Amy Porterfield that was on smartpassiveincome.com. Okay. So that's, that's the trick. And this is actually really useful for a lot of things. But if you're looking for stories, here's what you do. You do that same thing, but in the quotations, you put great story, awesome story, oh. cool story. Okay. And then you put in a forum URL where your people hang out, which you already have a list of because that's in your market map that I just taught you. And if you do that, you're going to see amazing real life accounts of your target audience going through life, telling okay, about their struggles, cool. talking about what they're going through. And those are people that you could reach out to and talk about, uh, talk to even further. That way you, you're not just talking to somebody who's made up. You're talking to, you're getting to know people and it, forums are great, too, because there's a lot of content on there, obviously, if there's popular ones in your niche. But also, forums are where people who have like interests hang out. And a lot of times, people open up on forums more than they do to their families because they just feel like they can connect with those people, right? Yep. So that's the trick for getting really into the feels of your, of your audience. And, and when you and say that, feels, you're talking F-E-E-L. Like, oh, emotions. Gotcha. Yes, emotions, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just... That's like a feels is a new word term. for me. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. The feels, all the feels. Like, <laughs> like that's what April and I say when, when there's like a part in a Netflix series that we're seeing that's like, you know, we're starting to tear up. We always go, the feels. Okay. I've never heard that before. <laughs> I'm going to totally start using it. <laughs> oh, the feels. Uh, okay. And then the N. So we did problems, language, anecdotes, and the N. The N is what you believe the needs are. That becomes your hypothesis, that becomes the test that you run in your validation process. And I love this because I talk about this in the book too, how it's sort of like Mythbusters. I don't know if you've seen Mythbusters. Oh yeah, I love that show. It's one of my favorite shows. And the, you know, they, they put these myths, things that people say are true or not maybe, uh, but they put them to the test and they use a particular method, science, a scientific method to bust or confirm those myths to say, yes, this is actually true or no, this is not. They know for sure. They take these things that are hypothesis and they put them to the test. And that's exactly what we're gonna be doing in the validation formula, which is like the final part of the book, which, okay, you've gone through all this research, you've discovered all this stuff about your audience. A lot of times people who have ideas going to this book, their idea morphs into something completely different at this point. Oh, really? Because, yeah, because now you're actually putting data behind, you know, what it is that you're going to be providing. You know, that idea that you have, it's just an idea. And there's, there's not any proven research behind it. But now you've gone through the research, you've found out what it is that's going on in that market already. You've gotten into the heads of your audience and you are now creating products that actually matter to them. And so a lot of times people, when they go through this process, they actually throw away their original idea, but now they've gotten a brand new one that is, you know, at this point validated in terms of research, and now we're going to go validate it in, uh, with them. Okay, what I'm already loving about this book is that I feel like it's a really good hand-holding book. Like you are going to take people through this entire process. Do this, then do that, do this. Yep. I feel like this has not ever been created out there yet. Like this no. is brand new. You know, a couple things. I'm not the first person to talk about validation. Right. You know, Tim Ferriss talked about it in 2007 in a chapter in the four hour work week called Testing the Muse, where he 
uh, validated, uh, I think it was French sailor shirts as a business. And he did that by running paid advertisements to a landing page with a buy now button. He just clicked or he just kept track of how many clicks that had. And that essentially confirmed that people would or would not buy that thing. Um, but, uh, the other thing about that is, you know, I, I love reading books. I know you do too. And I know a lot of people out there love reading, but one of my pet peeves with books is like the ones that tell you all this awesome stuff, but they don't show you how to do it, Yes, you know? And so this is what the, my book, I mean, I'm not like everybody else I feel. And so I wanted to be like, okay, well, how can I make this book different and more useful? So I actually, you know, walk you through the process. I hold your hand, but also, and the other cool thing is I actually do these exercises with you. The airport test, I share line by line what is under my family quadrant, what nice. is under my professional quadrant, all those things, the history test. I go into the past and show you my jobs too because especially that first part, like opening up about who you are in your past, that's, that's an uncomfortable thing to do sometimes. And a lot of times we just avoid that because it's, we don't want to know sometimes. But hopefully by opening up and sharing my part of the story, you know, you can come on, uh, you know, and do it with me. Again, lead by example. That's, I was going to say, yeah, that's your style. And it's always like, you're the guy that will say like, I'll go first. Yeah, I'll do exactly. it. Exactly. You yeah. know, I really that, like that. So yeah, thank you. And you make it so real. So when you use your own examples, when you go first, you're going to make us all really understand what it's going to look like and what it's going to do for our business. So I, I am so excited, but I know we're not done. So keep going. Okay. Yeah. And, and on the examples thing, like I, I pulled out examples for the past. I pulled out examples of my existing businesses, but in the part where I talk about um, the customer plan, I actually say, okay, well, I'm just going to pick something random and we're going to run through this together with something completely random to show you that this works for everything. Oh, so nice. I actually use the fly fishing as the niche and we go and discover problems that fly fishermen have and the language that they use okay. and certain stories. And so stuff. funny that you chose that because I could be wrong, but was the first time you ever went fly fishing when I was with you? Yeah, we were in Colorado Springs for That's a platform right. conference. And you went and, fly fishing uh, all by himself, guys. I got to tell you, this is so funny. We were at an event, a Michael Hyatt's event. We were both speaking. And I said, so what are you doing tomorrow? I think we like had the day off or something. He's like, oh, I've yeah. already booked my fly fishing. I'm going alone. I have a guide. I'm going to do it. I'm like by yourself? And like Pat does anything by himself. And he always takes these advantages like when we're out and about to take <laughs> in the scenery and do something that he wouldn't normally do. And I remember he like really enjoyed it. Oh gosh, it was the time of my life. I mean, being out in nature, standing in water, I caught a couple of brown trout. It was like, <laughs> man, it was all, I had, I've done every other kind of fishing except ice fishing and fly fishing. And so I wanted to check that off the bucket list. And so I do use that as an example, just because actually, interestingly enough, for whatever reason, back in 2009, when I started talking about business, that was, the, that was the example I always use. You know how some people always That's use funny. like scrapbooking or knitting as yep. a kind of like funny example, like fly fishing was always my funny example. And then I ended up doing it last year and now it's in the book. It's just kind of funny. So perfect. So to finish off, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to, I mean, the book is a couple hundred pages long and it, it does walk you through the process. But again, I'm not, I'm not afraid to share as much as I can to help you guys out. But the validation formula works like this. So there's, there's, there's certain steps that need to happen because again, you could even build something at this point with all the research you've done. And likely it is something that could potentially be helpful, but you don't know exactly if that's something that your customers would want because you haven't really talked to them yet. You don't know. You need to get them to not just uh, validate with their their words. You need to validate with, you know, their their payment. This is big. I, I got to I don't want to keep interrupting you. But one no. thing I have to say is so many people say, I don't know why it didn't work because I asked my audience. They said they would totally buy this. And I'm always thinking, yeah, but they haven't bought it. Right. And there's actually uh, some devices in the book to help you if it doesn't work out to really discover, well, what went wrong. Okay. And, and so the, the first part is you just need to get in front of an audience. So you have this hy hypothetical business idea, what you feel like would work. You need to get in front of, a, of that target audience. And, you know, this is where a lot of people struggle when they teach validation because they automatically assume that people have an audience to get in front of already. They already have a blog, for example, which may or may not be the case for a lot of your listeners. A lot of people who run through this process of, and want to validate don't have an audience. So they get stuck like in step one. But in the book, I give you seven different ways that you can get in front of somebody else's audience to continue this validation formula. So it's going to be really helpful for you, whether you have a business or not, or whether you have an audience already or not. There are ways to get in front of somebody else's audience. You just have to get in front of an audience because the example I use in the book is let's say, Amy, that we're a photographer and we came up with this amazing software for photography for wedding photographers, for okay. specifically for wedding photographers. Well, maybe we land a guest post on a top photography blog, but we need to, in step two, hyper-target, which means we need to find out who in that audience that we're speaking to 
our wedding photographers because those are the people who would obviously use our or potentially use our solution. You know, get in front of that audience, but then you need to hyper target. You need to get the people who your thing would actually be useful to essentially raise their hand in that audience and say, oh, yeah, I have that problem. And then you go and, and, and interact with them. That's step three. You interact with them. You share your solution. You kind of gauge the interest from there. And then the final step is you actually ask for the transaction. You literally say, you know what? I want to build this, and I need to know that you are in. And if you are, I need you to, to pre-order it or pay for it. And I actually give you a whole number of examples of all different kinds of people in all different kinds of niches who have done this. And I actually break down the way they've done it in the same exact steps. And they've done it in different ways. Some people get in front of an audience by paying for ads and doing webinars. You know, and that, that's how they target um, and some people have done it just through Facebook groups. Other people have done it in person at events. And there's all these different kinds of ways to do it. But the interesting thing is you're honest about this the whole time. You know, Tim Ferriss was doing it in a way that was, I mean, it wasn't bad, but he, he was like pretending that the thing actually existed and then clicking, tra uh, keeping track of the clicks and then gauging from there. And then when people clicked, yes, I, I want to buy this, you just said like, oh, this is out of stock. That's not what you're doing here. You're, you're honest about the fact that you haven't created this thing yet. You're saying, hey, guys, I want to just gauge the interest here. And I want to make sure this is something people want. And for example, you'd say something like, okay, I want to get, if I get 20 people and you tell this to people who you're talking to, if I get 20 people who say and pay, and pay up front, then I will go build it. And the cool thing about this is you're going to get it at a discounted price, obviously, because you're going to be an early adopter. You're also going to be able to influence what this product becomes. So it kind of incorporates a lot of the lean startup model or method here too, which is, again, not everyone's going to want to pre-order it, but there's a certain percentage of people who will want to if it is something in that particular audience that they would find useful. There's that early adopter phase, and they would chomp to the bit at wanting to get involved with this if it is something that is actually helpful. And so that, that's where this goes. And again, it's, it's a lot easier to explain this through the examples that I've shared with other people. Like, right. for example, Noah Kagan, he, within 24 hours, validated a beef jerky subscription box company. I don't know if you know this. <laughs> no. it's, called, it's called Sumo Jerky. I didn't and, know that. Oh, yeah, totally. And there's actually a bonus interview because I, I was in Austin for an event and I interviewed him and that comes along with a companion course. And I'll talk about that in a second. Okay. But yeah, he validated a Sumo Jerky subscription box service. And he got paid $1,000 in 24 hours for this idea that wasn't even built yet. Okay, because I was going to ask you, we're talking about products that are online and physical products oh, and services. Products. Okay, good. So yeah. it totally runs the gamut. And I want to jump in here because leading up to this, Pat, I've been talking so much on my podcast about webinars. And one of the things that I teach inside my webinar program is if you don't already have an online training course, you can sell a live workshop. You sell it first on your webinar, then you deliver it afterwards, which is basically the first thing I did before I had an online training program. But if somebody were to go through your entire book, they got really clear on what they wanted to sell. And then they used the webinar system I teach to actually sell, let's say they're doing a live workshop, a live online workshop, then that's exactly like a good fit between the two. And I wanted to point oh, that out because oh. I know some people are listening like, wait a second, you kind of talk about this, Amy. I do, but what I don't do in my program is help you validate the idea. So your book and my idea of selling a live workshop go hand in hand. Oh, I think so. For sure. Yeah. That's really cool. Okay. Wait. So I have a question for you inside your book in the very beginning, you say the words, it's not you who is being tested. It's your ideas. And after listening to you go through, you know, all the steps here, I want to know why you thought that was really important to kind of start things out with. Yeah. Because you know what? Like a lot of people are going to go through this book and their ideas aren't going to pass the tests. And a lot of times when our ideas don't pass the test, we feel like we're failures. We just get upset because we didn't choose the right one or it didn't go the way we expected and we just give up, right? And that's not what you should do. No matter what happens when you go through this book, it is a win because you've discovered this now, you know, instead of waiting two years down the road to finally realize that this isn't a thing that is going to work out. Right. You know, so this isn't about... You, you know, testing you, it's about testing your idea. And that, that's, that's kind of the litmus, what the litmus tests are for. Um, and, and, and I wanted to make sure that was clear moving forward because a lot of people are going to feel like, you know, that they're, they're just not on the right path when they discover that, you know, maybe something wasn't going the way that it was supposed to. So that, that's why I mentioned uh, that. And that kind of goes along with, you know, the story I tell at the beginning, and I know you read this part where, I talk about, it, it's a story I start out with, and it kind of goes along with the title, Will It Fly? And it, that's on my son's third birthday. Do you remember the story? Mm -hmm. When I was talking about how on my, on my son's third birthday, like I was so excited because I wanted to show him 
a paper airplane because paper airplanes, you know, my dad and I, that was like a thing we did all the time. And when he turned three, I was like, okay, like he can understand this now. And so I actually built a paper airplane and he threw it and he was just like mesmerized. He was so like, oh my gosh, ha like magic. Like I just folded <laughs> this piece of paper and just made magic happen. And so of course, being a three-year-old boy, he just kind of was like so excited that he wanted to do the same thing in himself. But before I could even instruct him to, to like how to fold the wings because there's a certain way to do it. He just started crumpling paper and just like would pretend to fold it, you know, just kind of didn't know what he was <laughs> doing, you know. And obviously it's very easy to imagine a kid doing that. And then he came up with this thing that look, looked more like a boat. Like it, uh, it obviously wasn't going to fly, but you know, I was like, okay, throw it. And he, he threw it, it didn't go anywhere. And then he threw it again, didn't go anywhere. And then he said, I hate paper airplanes. Oh. You know, it's like you just tried two times. Like I didn't even teach you. But, you know, that's how a lot of people build their businesses. It's, it's like, true. you know, they see somebody doing something. They go through similar motions, I guess you could say. And then they see what happens and it doesn't work. And they just are like, oh, I suck. Uh, this isn't for me. But nobody was there to help them engineer their wings, I guess you could say. And so actually what I ended up doing was like, first I was like, no, this I can't end his paper airplane career like this. <laughs> like we have to fix this. So I'm like, okay, watch me, follow what I do, fold this one, fold this one. And, you know, it's a really simple kind of dart design one. And then I, he ended up folding one that was pretty close and he threw it and it flew a little bit, but it flew. And he was so excited because he took this thing that was just paper. And that's sort of like your idea is you're taking this idea and you have to just fold it in a certain way and test it to see if it's actually going to fly. And now like he's like a paper airplane machine because he's just like every day in the morning I go downstairs and there's <laughs> paper airplanes strewn on the floor. I'm not even kidding. Um, and it's so fun. And, you know, it's it's kind of uh, it's cool because like now he's like trying new designs and trying different ways and he's not afraid to fail anymore. Like he knows that that failure at the beginning was just part of the process. And, you know, the more iterations he goes through, the more likely he is uh, to find something that works. Imagine the confidence you'll have when you actually do take yourself through this entire validation process and you feel really good that, okay, I did the homework. I learned more about my audience. I know why I'm doing it and who I'm doing it for. And so when you start putting everything in motion, spending the time, money, and energy on it, you have something to back it up where so many people, like you said, they don't do this work up front. So they're kind of flying blind. And that is a really scary feeling in the online marketing world totally, for sure. Totally. So, which is most of my audience. Okay. So tell us about where you can get the book. And then also you've got some bonuses and extras. Yeah. I mean, there are bonuses that are available. So with the book can be found at willitflybook.com. And, um, the, the cool bonus that I created, cause a lot of, a lot of people give bonuses, you know, with their books and a lot of people, um, have these things that you could download worksheets and whatnot. And I, I wanted to, to see if there was a different way that I could do it again. I'm, I'm always trying to test. I was going to say that is so you to um, take it so, to a different level. <laughs> so what I did was I created a free online course and this course is laid out in the exact same way that the book is laid out chapter Ugh, by chapter. Love it. And so as you're reading the book, you can go into the chapters in this course, what I call the companion course, and you can download the worksheets that are there for that particular part of the book that you're reading. You could see videos of me walking you through some of the more difficult parts or the parts that I felt like people needed a little bit more motivation for. You can go and get the links for all the things mentioned in that particular chapter. And um, I thought that would be a fun way to kind of enhancing experience of the book. It's sort of like, I don't know if you watched uh, Walking Dead, Amy, but oh yeah, um, every time before a new episode comes out, they say, go to this website and get your story sync so you can get an enhanced experience yes. of Walking Dead where you like go on the website and it kind of plays as you're watching Walking Dead and you get kind of these behind the scenes and all this. Like, I was like, oh man, I want to see if I can do this with the book. And then, you know, I think it's a really cool way and fun way to to get people to, um, to, to get involved with the book. And, you know, quite honestly, it's also a way for me to collect email addresses too. I'm not going to just lie and pretend that that's not part of the process. I think it's a genius strategy overall. It's a win-win. And if they go to willitflybook.com, are you going to tell them how they can get that access to the course? Yeah, absolutely. It's in the, it's in the first few pages of the book. And, um, you know, I think, uh, it'll be, it'll be really fun and exciting for people. I think that this book is going to be a smashing hit. I have no Thanks doubt. So. And I know how much love and um, all your energy that you put into it, like everything you do, you do with purpose. And this is going to be no exception. So what would be your last parting words for someone that's thinking, I don't know, maybe I got to pick up this book. Uh, pick it up. And um, no, uh, <laughs> thank you for being interested in it. Uh, if, if you have any questions about it, feel free to tweet me at Pat Flynn. You know, I, I don't want to force people to get it like the moment it comes out because I know a lot of people want to see how other people react to it too. But, 
you know, I'd love for you to, to take part in the exercises. I think it'll be very helpful. And I, and I know it has because I've not just created this from scratch. I've created it through validation of these exercises with other people too. And so, you know, I'm, I'm walking the walk as much as I talk the talk. You truly are. And congratulations for finally completing this book. And I cannot Mm -hmm. wait for so many people to get their hands on it. It's going to scary. I know it's so so exciting (laughs) though. You should be so excited and proud of yourself. So Pat, thank you so much for being with us. I truly appreciate it. And I want to encourage everyone to grab the book. I'll make sure to put a link to it in my show notes as well. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate you. All right. Take care everyone. And I can't wait to connect with you again next week. Bye for now. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Pat. I know I always love talking to him and such great insights and tips and tricks to help validate your big idea. So make sure to grab your copy at willitflybook.com and I cannot wait to connect with you again next week. Until then, make it a great week. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Online Marketing Made Easy podcast at www.amyporterfield.com.